Introduction As empires expanded overseas and the allure of the New World prompted a surge in migration from the Old World to the New, the mid-19th to mid-20th century witnessed a remarkable demand for increased cargo and passenger capacity on intercontinental voyages. In response to this surge in demand, nations subsidized companies to construct faster and larger ships, leading to the emergence of a new category of vessels, which would become known as ocean liners. However, the Industrial Revolution would not be the only factor. The discovery of gold in regions of Western North America and the following gold rush was another significant factor in drawing people across the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. While ocean liners emerged in response to the increasing demand for intercontinental shipping, their ability to revolutionize the industry was made possible through the dependable service they could provide compared to sailing vessels, thanks to technological developments such as the steam engine and significant improvements in ship size starting in the latter half of the 19th century. Welcome to Compelling History, and today we begin our voyage through a four-part video series on the history of ocean liners, starting with this video on the early beginnings of regular transatlantic service. In future videos, we will cover the competition that followed, their service during wartime, and their eventual downfall in popularity. Make sure you're subscribed so you know once the second part is released next week. Part 1. Rising Demand for Intercontinental Shipping Resulting from the Industrial Revolution, the economies of Europe's most powerful empires were rapidly transitioning away from being agrarian-based and towards industrialization. Although this happened at different points for each nation, industries were utilizing new technology and machines that dramatically increased productivity. In the United Kingdom, for example, the abundance of coal and iron ore helped fuel the growth of these industries, which in turn supported the expansion of other industries such as powering the rail and shipping industries. To help fuel these and other factories throughout their empire, many sought to obtain more overseas territories rich in resources which could be harvested and shipped back to Europe to be manufactured into items for sale. Long before the Industrial Revolution, the United Kingdom was known for its seafaring population and skilled shipbuilders. During this time, the UK had the largest navy the world had ever seen, which was needed in order to protect its vast empire. At its height in the early 20th century, the British Empire had over 50 colonies around the globe, many of which required weeks or even months of travel on slow, unreliable sailing vessels. Given this, it was only fitting that one of the first regular passenger shipping routes was between Great Britain and another part of its empire. One of the earliest regular passenger shipping routes was operated by the Black Bell Line, which ferried passengers across the North Atlantic from the UK to Canada, then down to the United States before retracing its steps back to the UK, taking anywhere from a few weeks to even a few months due to reliance on wind power. The vessels operated by the line, known as packet boats, were specifically designed to prioritize passenger comfort during the long voyage. Some Black Bell's early ships, the Pacific, Amity, Courier, and James Monroe, these ships would carry mail, passengers, and freight on the regular but slow and unreliable voyages across the North Atlantic. While the Europe to North America route was one of the busiest for the British and other European empires, the journey pales in comparison to the amount of time it took traveling to colonies in the Far East or Australia, which could take anywhere from four and odd seven months of sailing before arriving. While the transportation of passengers and cargo within a multi-continental empire or with former colonies like the United States was crucial, it wasn't the sole driving force behind the surge in overseas shipments. Industrializing empires also heightened their trade with other European counterparts, seeking resources unavailable domestically or goods scarce in their home territories. The Industrial Revolution not only spurred increased production and trade, but also directed nations to focus their manufacturing capabilities strategically, either capitalizing on their advantages or fulfilling needs unmet by others. This specialization significantly boosted productivity and economic growth in unprecedented ways. For instance, spurred by machinery advancements, Britain emerged as a major exporter of cotton and wool textiles, fostering increased trade with other European nations and empires. While transporting mail and cargo was vital for their success, ocean liners are more famously known for their passenger amenities, and the companies operating them were in constant competition to outdo one another with either the fastest, largest, or most lavish ship. In 1840, Canadian entrepreneur Sir Samuel Cunard founded the Cunard Line to fulfill a British government mail contract and provide regular passenger services. The contract was crucial for their early success, as it not only provided subsidies, but also helped them establish a reliable and punctual reputation in the shipping industry. The first Cunard ship, RMS Britannia, launched in February 1840, was a hybrid sail and steam-powered liner, crossing the North Atlantic in just 12 days and 10 hours, a significant innovation compared to traditional sailing ships that took three to six weeks for the same journey. 
Five years after the founding of the Cunard Line, John Pilkington and Henry Wilson established their own shipping company, initially named Liverpool, Melbourne, and Oriental Steam Navigation Company, later renamed the White Star Line. While Cunard prioritized speed and efficiency, White Star Line focused on passenger comfort and luxury. In its early days, White Star Line operated wind-powered sailing ships, unlike Cunard's hybrid fleet. Despite this difference, both British companies had similar sized ships and engaged in intense competitions starting in the 1860s, which we'll cover in the next video. Following the success of Cunard and White Star in the mid-19th century, two other prominent ocean liner companies, Compagnie Générale Transatlantique, commonly known as the French Line, and Norddeutscher Lloyd, North German Lloyd, also left their mark on the maritime industry. The French Line, founded in 1861, prioritized luxury travel and established itself as a symbol of elegance and opulence for transatlantic passengers. Its flagship, the SS Normandy, epitomized this luxury with its Art Deco interiors and impeccable service. On the other side of the Atlantic, Norddeutscher Lloyd, founded in 1857, focused on efficiency and speed in transporting both passengers and cargo. The SS Bremen and SS Europa were two of its renowned vessels, setting speed records for transatlantic crossings. These companies, each with their unique approach, played pivotal roles in shaping the transatlantic travel experience during their heyday. Another reason why ocean liners became prominent starting in the 1800s was the exponential increase in migration to North America. The first sign of this occurred with the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, where the U.S. doubled its size on the continent. Additionally, the establishment and increased use of the Oregon Trail, which initially served as a fur trading route, witnessed substantial growth in usage by westward settlers starting in the 1830s. The use of this trail would further increase, in part, due to the gold rush that took off after the discovery of Californian gold in 1848, further expanding into the Canadian and American Klondike soon after. The discovery inspired people from as far away as Europe to travel to the area, hoping to strike it rich during the early days of the gold rush. This wasn't the only thing drawing people to resettle in the New World, Many people fled their homelands in Europe to escape famine, poor economic conditions, and religious persecution. All of these factors would contribute to an increase in trade and passenger travel across the Atlantic, requiring greater advances in technology to sustain this rapid expansion. Part 2. Evolution Beyond Wood and Sails In the late 1600s, coal mines were vital in keeping European homes warm and fueling the early stages of the Industrial Revolution. Working in these mines was a harsh, labor-intensive job that, depending on the mine, could involve working in dark, cramped tunnels deep underground. These mines were dangerous to say the least, but one of the biggest issues these mines faced was water coming in from the mine's entrance or seeping through the walls themselves. If a mine were to begin filling with water, miners would rush to remove it as quickly as possible with buckets if it was minor, or evacuate to if they needed to minimize the risk they faced of injuring themselves from drowning from flash floods or potentially being buried alive after the water has weakened the walls of the mine. To address this, British engineer Thomas Savory introduced a groundbreaking invention in the 17th century known as the Miner's Friend. This device featured a small boiler that generated steam. As the steam filled an attached chamber, cold water was sprayed over the exterior, causing the steam to condense and creating a vacuum. This vacuum in turn lowered the pressure inside the chamber, allowing atmospheric pressure to force water from the mine into the chamber. The miner's friend was revolutionary for its time, representing the first successful application of steam power in a mechanical process to solve the persistent problem of water accumulation in mines. While it may not have seemed groundbreaking for applications outside of mining at the time, Savory's invention underwent significant refinement over the course of decades, notably by James Watt. Eventually, a larger and more complex steam engine, developed through iterative improvements, played a pivotal role in powering the Clermont on its historic journey from New York City to Albany. The North River Steamboat, or as it has also become known as the Clermont, was a small sailing vessel, 142 feet in length, 18 foot beam, and 62 feet tall, but could also be powered by two large paddle wheels located on each side of the ship. This short voyage up the Hudson River was one of the earliest demonstrations of the maritime steam engine's capabilities and potential. While this voyage of the Claremont was an important step in the development of steamships, there was still much that needed to be worked out before. In May to June of 1819, the SS Savannah would become the first ship to cross the North Atlantic powered in part by steam. Steam engines and ships such as the Savannah were large, complex works of machinery that were far more powerful than other steam-powered vehicles at the time, such as the ones powering steam locomotives. Some wooden ships, such as those on the Franklin Expedition, would have old train engines added for occasional support. 
To operate these engines, coal was burned in a boiler, which in turn would convert that energy to turn the shifts connected to the ship's propellers. The smoke generated from these engines would be then expelled through tall funnels, which rose high above the top decks. They were built to rise this high to prevent ash from covering the equipment or passengers. While the SS Savannah used steam to power part of its voyage, it did much of the crossing using its sails as propulsion. Early steamships, like the SS Savannah, or later the SS Great Easternly, still had sails which could be used to propel the ship in a traditional manner when winds were favorable, and could switch to using steam power in ports or non-favorable wind conditions. There were also a number of other reasons for these early ships to still have sails, such as fuel efficiency and crew familiarity. The amount of wood or coal needed to power these ships was immense and would not always be available or affordable for long voyages. Still having sails allowed these ships to only burn its fuel when absolutely necessary, making them more cost efficient. It is also important to remember that sailing ships were the norm for centuries. When they were first introduced, they were crewed by sailors with generations of skill and knowledge of harnessing wind power passed down to them and limited or no in-depth knowledge on the newer steam engines. The fear was that, if anything were to happen to the steam engines during a voyage, a lack of sails would leave the crew unable to bring the ship back to safety. This wouldn't last forever though, and as more sailors became familiar with the steam engine, sails were gradually removed from steamships. There were many reasons the shipping industry wanted to move away from wind power and towards the newer steam engine, with the main being reliability, speed and efficiency, reduced crew requirements, and navigation. These benefits were considered so crucial to the expansion of a liner company or empire that hybrid ships remained the industry norm for decades after the SS Savannah, even as steam technology advanced to the point where sails could be rendered completely redundant. Until the first naval steam engine was installed, ships were completely reliant on whether the wind was blowing strong enough to propel their ships forward. In contrast, once steam engines were improved to a point where they could effectively power ships across an ocean at a constant rate, the only thing they required to propel forward was a small team working to keep a constant supply of coal or iron flowing into its boilers. For the first time in history, passengers and goods could be shipped by sea on a regular and consistent basis without the very real possibility of a weeks-long delay. This consistency in how its propulsion system is powered was a key factor in why steam-powered ships could also cross oceans such as the North Atlantic in much shorter durations than their wind-powered counterparts. Steam also freed ships of seasonal wind constraints that would otherwise make year-round connections to distant parts of the world not feasible. The reliability and predictability of steam power opened new opportunities for what could be shipped between continents and who would be willing to make the voyage to overseas colonies and nations. These strong trade routes would be the beginning of a growing network of shipping routes spanning across the world's oceans and requiring thousands of sailors to keep moving. Sailing ships would require crews over 100 individuals, including a captain, one first mate, one second mate, one boatswain, one carpenter, one cook, 30, 60 sailors to man the sails, and 10, 20 additional sailors for various other tasks. These relatively large crew sizes required ships to carry more food and allocate more space for the crew both of which decrease profitability. In contrast, the average steamships required a captain, three deck officers, three four-engine crew, a cook, six to eight, firemen, coal passers, and about 15 other crew members. These crew also required less skill than what was required in preparing the various sails around older ships. Smaller crews were partly made possible because of the reliability the steam engines provide. Navigation is an essential part in operating any vessel, regardless of propulsion type, but steam-powered ships would have some advantages over the older wind-powered ones. For one, the independence that steam power provided allowed for ships to stay on course without having to detour due to the winds. It also allowed for an ease of maneuverability in ports and tight canals not possible with traditional sailing vessels. Another reason for the navigational improvement of steamships had to do with the predictability mentioned earlier. Ships no longer had to set their course based on where the best winds would be, and instead could plot the most efficient route. It should also be mentioned that during the 1800s, there were improvements to navigational equipment, such improved compasses, sectants, and chronometers. When combined, these improvements in navigation helped steamships become safer and more efficient. With the metallurgy and manufacturing processes becoming refined and industrialized, steel for the new ship hulls was becoming a stronger and more cost-effective option for shipbuilding. Full steel hulled ships became common in ships alongside steam engines, and they would bring their own set of improvements to ship design and reliability. For one, steel offered a stronger, more durable, and more rot-resistant material that improved the overall strength of the ship and allowed for even greater sizes than previously possible with wooden hulls. 
Ships with steel hulls also fared better in the harsh, open ocean conditions, with better stability and lower risk of the hull becoming damaged due to stress. Another reason for steel becoming the standard with ships during this time was the ability to create more hydrodynamic and fuel-efficient designs. The only real obstacle to the emergence of steel ships was the corrosive effect saltwater had on them over longer periods of time. However, later advancements included anti-corrosion measures that could combat this saltwater corrosion, such as protective coatings to prevent contact with the water. The Industrial Revolution not only spurred new inventions, but also paved the way for advancements in materials applicable to existing items. A demonstrative case is the shift from wooden ship hulls to steel hulls, presenting a host of advantages which were crucial for the growth of the ocean liner industry. It wasn't just improvements in the design process, however. It also had increased resistance to decay and corrosion, requiring less maintenance. Wooden ships were susceptible to decay from water exposure, fungi, and marine organisms, which would reduce their lifespan and lead to more time in dry dock for repairs or replacements when compared to the newer steel hulls. Part three, growing ships and competition. As the need for sailing masts was diminishing with the rise of the maritime steam engine, an engineer soon discovered that larger ships could take advantage of what's now referred to as economies of scale. As the size of the ship increased, the cost per unit of cargo and passenger capacity decreases, meaning larger ships were more cost-effective in terms of both construction and operation. In addition to the economies of scale, larger ships were also more fuel-efficient per unit of cargo or passenger transported. Larger vessels also take advantage of more efficient propulsion systems and benefit from a lower surface area to volume ration, reducing drag in the water. During the first half of the 1800s, the largest ocean liners had a tonnage between 1,370 tons and 3,670 tons, such as the SS Great Western, which made regular transatlantic crossings between 1838 and 1846. During the latter half of the century, the largest liners had tonnages between 10,499 tons and 18,915 tons, such as the previously mentioned Great Eastern, which operated similar transatlantic routes from 1858 and 1888. At the time, the Great Eastern was well known for being the largest ship of its time, before being surpassed by the RMS Oceanic in 1899, 11 years after the Great Eastern was scrapped. As mentioned previously, steel hulls led to the ability for stronger ships that could be larger in size than any wooden hull would allow. This inevitably led to ocean liner companies to begin designing larger and larger ships that had an increased capacity for cargo and passengers. Advancements in other technologies, such as improving engines and navigation tools, allowed for ocean liners to become larger while retaining efficiency, accuracy, and importantly, becoming more reliable. The increase in trade associated with this period discussed in the first part of this video was another significant factor for the increase in the size of ocean liners. This increase in trade and passenger traffic between continents combined with the economies of scale made it more cost-effective for companies to focus their operations towards fewer, larger ships instead of more frequent, smaller ones. This move towards larger ships not only lead to more passenger capacity and therefore earning potential, but would also be associated with the changing passenger expectations. Larger ships had room to offer more amenities missing on their older counterparts, which also meant the journey between continents would be more comfortable than ever before. This would also lead to competition between the companies who owned and operated these ocean liners, which will be the topic covered next week. Conclusion Ocean liners, integral to the historical tapestry of intercontinental travel, epitomized the profound shifts of the mid-19th to mid-20th century. As empires expanded and the call of the New World spurred mass migration, a burgeoning need for enhanced cargo and passenger capacity catalyzed the evolution of a distinctive maritime category, the ocean liner. Subsidized by nations eager to facilitate global connectivity, these vessels, born of necessity, embodied the intersection of technological innovation and a surging demand for reliable intercontinental transport. The advent of ocean liners marked not only a response to heightened shipping demands, but also a pivotal leap forward in technological prowess. Fueled by advancements in steam engines and steel hulls, these vessels transcended the limitations of traditional sailing ships, offering unparalleled dependability and efficiency. The transformative impact of ocean liners extended beyond the confines of maritime history, echoing the present-day landscape where emerging industries driven by the imperative for connectivity and grand-scale projects trace their lineage back to the pioneering spirit that defined the era of ocean travel. Thank you so much for watching part one of Compelling History's series on ocean liners. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss part two of this series and give this video a like to help the channel grow. Now I want to hear from you. If you could take a voyage on any ocean liner in history, which liner would you choose and where would you head?